I'd like to introduce you all to two close personal friends of the show. John and John are a pair of law enforcement officers with three decades of combined experience in helping people stay safe and what happens when that fails. They've built a shop, Shield Protection Products, that offers a full range of self-defense items like pepper spray and stun guns that real people can use in the real world. They're like-minded folks, so they also offer important safety equipment like fire extinguishers, medical kits, and car escape tools. They provide an instructional video with every purchase so you know how to use anything you buy. Find them at shieldprotectionproducts.com and use the discount code SFOTB10 to get 10% off of your purchase. That's SFOTB10 at shieldprotectionproducts.com. Seriously, friends, if you're looking for the best equipment to keep your family safe, along with advice from knowledgeable professionals on how to use it, while supporting this show and a small business that deserves it, you'll find it at Shield Protection Products. Go check them out and tell them Safest Family on the Block sent you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Safest Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is Dr. Robert Chukro. Hello, Dr. Chukro. How are you today? Hi. Great, great to have you on here. Now, folks, uh, Dr. Chuck Rowe has had an interest in nutrition and natural hygiene for most of his life and has taught these subjects in a number of venues. He studied Tai Chi, Qigong, and other movement and healing arts since 1970. His The Tai Chi book was a finalist among the three best books in the health medicine category in the Independent Publisher Book Awards. His most recent book, Tai Chi Dynamics, was honored in the martial arts alternative health category by the independent publisher online magazine highlighted title program. It was a finalist in Forward Magazine's 2008 Book of the Year Awards, won the Eric Hoffer Book Award, and won the USA Book News Best Book Award in Health, Exercise, and Fitness. Dr. Chuck Rose's PhD is in experimental physics from NYU, and he has taught physics at NYU, the Cooper Union, Fieldstron, and other schools for 43 years. He knows his stuff backwards and forwards, and he's on today to talk to us about the importance of balance and ways we can apply concepts from Tai Chi to improving our balance on a day-to-day -day basis. I th it's funny, it's come up on some of our interviews with other serious martial artists that of all the self-defense skills that I've learned, kicking and punching might save me, but break falls, I have to call on at least once a year. And even better than using break falls is not falling down in the first place. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess the first question I'd have is, what are the things that cause us to lose our balance and to fall down as a general rule? Um, I think the main thing is inattentiveness inattentiveness and uh, there's a principle uh, in Taiji which is being in the moment and being in the moment means that you are processing whatever is happening um, around you but only but processing what's appropriate so of the myriad things that are that that come into your um, nervous system and your awareness, you're picking out the things that are of importance, that, that are appropriate, and that changes moment by moment. So it's not a, a, a form of concentration, it's of just a form of observation. And um, the, the, what I found is that I was um, forgetting things, that I was bumping into things, that I'd park my car when I'd go to a, a, a shopping mall, and then I'd come out and I didn't remember where my car was. I couldn't, or in the house, I might not have been able to find my car keys. So I made up my mind to start connecting to what's happening right now, as I did everything. Did I lock the door? When I lock the door, I'm aware that I'm doing it. Instead of having my mind being in the future, where I'm thinking of where I'm going to go and what I'm going to do. Now, it's okay to be in the future because we need to do that from time to time and also be in the past. But f at certain times, it's essential to be in the present. Uh, so what I did is when I'd get out of my car, uh, I would look at the car, look at the surroundings, then walk backwards to the supermarket or the store and see it from the point of view of when I was coming out of the store. And I did that for maybe a week. 
But after that, I just would park my car and go into the store, come out, and just walk right to my car. And that's what I do now. The, the idea is you are using uh, the idea of something to impress on your subconscious mind, emblazon on your subconscious mind. Then the subconscious mind takes care of all of those things. Uh, so f riding a bicycle, chewing, chewing food, talking, all these things, we don't have to be conscious of exactly the mechanism of what's going on. We just do it. Well, when you're learning it, it's a different story. So that, that's uh, the way I see it, and it's, I think that that's one of the most important things because a lot of, I'm not saying all, but a lot of memory loss is due to not observing moment by moment. And what happens is you, what you don't use, you start to lose, it atrophies. So awareness is an extremely, attentiveness is a very important thing. Um, noticing where you're walking, noticing, um, also noticing the feeling on the soles of the feet, which I'll talk about later. Um, it's the feet are an early warning system that tell you if you pay attention, it tells you, they tell you when, when you're losing ba your balance much earlier on than before the point where you can't recover. Um, so, yeah, go, go ahead. It's interesting that you bring up mindful awareness because that's, that's a through line in interviews from everything from crime prevention to mental health to everything, just paying yes. attention. And here it is again, mind, mindful attentiveness. And more than that, kind of head on a swivel, tactical, heavily armed meerkat vibe that a lot of tactical instructors like to tell us to have. But instead, that joyful attentiveness to life and active curiosity. It's so vital on so many areas of safety, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, the uh, driving a car, when I drive, I catch myself thinking of something else. I bring myself back. I want to encompass all the cars that are on the road, what they're planning to do, what they, their speeds, their relative distances from, from me. So that when, when I, if I have to change lanes suddenly to, to avoid an accident, I know where everything is. I, I'm constantly reminding myself not to go, in, as soon as you go into the, to the future, now you're in the past because the present has gone by. And when you're in the past, you have to make up for it. And you sometimes can't. If you're going 60 miles an hour, that's 88 feet per second. The car moves 88 feet in one second if you're going 60 miles an hour. That means you've missed a lot, just one second of inattentiveness. Um, and one, one other thing is the, the cell phones, people have these... Uh, uh, no hands devices. Still, the amount of energy concentration that you have to use to imagine the other person you're talking to, um, instead of having the person right in front of you and not having to do that, takes so much energy away from whatever you're doing. So if I have to make a phone call or answer my phone, I'm off, I pull off the road, put on my double blinkers, and then say, I'll call you when I have a chance. You know, the, the traffic cop we had on a couple seasons ago who was came on to talk to how we could stop him from having the terrible day that he has when somebody makes a mistake with that that was the advice he gave as well to you know just just turn off the phone pull over so that you can give your attention where it needs to be yes so other elements are um vision and what we tend to do be because we uh, read a lot, use computers, we tend to focus on narrow fields of vision. That is, we're, what we're process the, everything is coming into our nervous system, but we choose to process only what is right in, along a straight line, which means that we're missing the peripheral vision. So part of the training that I had, my martial arts training was to start processing the whole panorama of everything around you, which we call soft vision instead of hard vision. Mm -hmm. And soft vision means that you're, you, you may not be able to see as clearly, but 
uh, it's, and it's not defocusing the eyes or anything like that. It's just pro processing more so that you're driving, you see a car coming up alongside you, or you're walking and you, you, you see that you might, somebody is coming up alongside you, and that's also self-protection too. Uh, so definitely vision is a big thing because now you're taking in so much more sense data that you can use for your balance because every movement you make, if you're using that kind of vision, the background changes, which is information, it's feedback on your movement, which again is, is another early warning system. So you can correct it, rather than succumb. Uh, and prevention rather than response is right, right. usually important. And one of the things about Tai Chi that I found, you know, my, my own Tai Chi experience is utterly dilettante compared to your own. But I've been training in various martial arts for about 37 years and included a couple tours of duty in, in Tai Chi, but other kata as well. I'm just barely smart enough to do a kata and do it marginally right. I'm not smart enough to do a kata and also plan what I'm going to have for dinner <laughs> or also worry about that fight I got in with my wife. So that the practice of Tai Chi and other forms is a great place to exercise this muscle of paying close attention in the moment because I, other people who are smarter than me might be able to do those and think of other things, but I think a lot of folks can't. Yeah, it's, it's a life's work because we have so many distractions. We're pulled in all directions. We're overstimulated by all the, all the devices that we have, uh, computers mm -hmm. and television and uh, it goes on and on. And we have to be, be able to make up for that because we, pay a pri we, can, we can pay a very heavy price if we, if we don't. So uh, pain is another thing. If you're in pain, that limits your movement. Uh, because we don't want to, we get used to not moving where it hurts. And then when you need to do that movement, it won't be there for you. So pain is another one and uh, it may or, you may or may not be able to do anything about that, but at least take it into account. Um, the um, lack of flexibility, that can be improved at any point. Uh, when I started uh, doing Taiji, I, when I hung, you know, bent forward and hung, my hands were at my knee level. Touch my toes, I couldn't even come close. Now, now I can put my, in, on a good day, I can put the palms of my hand on the floor, hands on the floor. And that took a while, but at least it wasn't getting, I wasn't losing flexibility. In fact, I was gaining it. It was flexibility and mobility Adapt, are your adaptability to a situation. And if you don't have much mobility, you, you're, that limits how much you can adapt to, to whatever situation is there. Uh, and equally important, or maybe, maybe a little less important, that improvement in your flexibility and range of motion, if you do fall down, you won't be as injured as badly. The, yes, well, knowing how to re yeah. what we call receive the ground. And what a lot of people do is they mm -hmm. stiffen up, bring their center, when they mm -hmm. feel that they're losing their balance, their center of gravity comes right up to their, their uh, uh, upper chest. Their arms become stiff because they're, they're, they're planning on using strength to, to break the, stop them themselves from falling. And all that does is lift their center of mass, which makes them hit harder. And then, injuries occur because you, there's no way that these arms are strong enough to, to um, uh, stop the, the, the momentum of mm -hmm. a, a, a much heavier body falling. Uh, being overweight is a problem. That is a problem. But sinking the weight is so important. And what, what I practice, and, and this is a big thing in Taiji, is a, a state called Sung which is a, a Chinese word for that, uh, the character for it is a pine tree with the branches hanging down. And then above that is, is hair, which has no strength. The idea of just letting, letting your hair hang out and 
have no no strength. And so what I do when I wake up in the morning, I I get out of bed, I stand for maybe 10, 20 seconds, and just recreate the heavy feeling that I get out of, when I get out of a hot bath. And of course I've slept a number of hours, so I, my body is relaxed and I can expe ex experience that to a very deep state. And then that calibrates what I can achieve later on in the day. And I do that periodically. So that if I'm walking on, let's say, ice or um, uh, uh, uneven ground, I sink my weight so that I'm, my center of gravity now is lower to the ground. And then if I do fall, I'm in a relaxed state so that I'm not gonna stiffen up. And the, the other thing is compacting the body by bending the knees and, and curving, curving the body so that it rolls rather than hits um, at one point. And uh, that's not something you can really study in, uh, in your senior years because you can get more injured by, by practicing falling than, than uh, the, you know, what you could become seriously injured. So the thing is, um, at least know the principle that, and when it happens, give in to, you don't give in to it too early because then you may fall and not need to. But if you reach the point where you know you can't recover, that's the time to start really giving in and going to help starting to move down already. If, if let's say I have a, a, a come out of the shop, supermarket and I have a, a bag and I feel a bag uh, filled with groceries, I feel a bag is starting to tear, I lower it to the ground mm -hmm. instead of letting the whole thing just fall from that height. I, I lower it and it, there's a principle in physics for that, but um, the, that then saves it from crashing to the ground. So you can do that with your body. It seems like a lot of martial arts, in my experience at least, has been finding ways to overcome some of our natural responses for a better way. And when we fall down, you know, our natural evolved response is to sacrifice the arms to save the head. And so, but that yeah. can mean nasty things. That's why we stiffen up and go like that. But if we learn the principles of accepting the fall, as you say, accepting the ground and rolling into it, that's that can save us a lot of lot of recovery time. And yes. you know, the statistics for what happens after a bad break for seniors are not friendly. Oh. So the the more we the more we do this, the more we learn this now, the more we encourage our older parents if they are not already doing that, the better the outcome, I would think. Well, I'm in my mid 80s and I'm very concerned about that. So listen, if you've gotten this far into the show, you like what I'm doing here. So do I, but I need your help to make it all it can be. For just a dime a day, you can help this happen by supporting the show on Patreon. In return, you'll get my undying thanks, early access to episodes, a monthly safety worksheet and other cool goodies. We're at patreon.com slash safest family and waiting for your help. Please consider it. It's three bucks a month to you, but a big deal to me. So I'm uh, regularly thinking about all of these things and uh, trying to adhere to them. Uh, and the, I think the thing is, we think that strength will save us in every situation. Mm -hmm. But strength it has tremendous value. We wouldn't have it if we didn't need it. But in that situation, it's not going to work. It's not. Well, going we're, to not work. we're not going to be stronger than the ground. <laughs> right. um, the Earth is much bigger and much older than us, and can be a bully. And it has a very strong gravitational effect. Yes. <laughs> uh, Ten meters per second per second. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now, I think we're, we're touching on a, a second topic that I think is important to a lot of our listeners who are thinking of how to take care of not just their children, but their parents as they get older, which is balance seems to deteriorate with age. And so, first of all, why does that happen? And more importantly, I think, what can we do about it? Uh, great, great question. Um, the It does deteriorate with age, and there are a number of reasons. One is... Uh, throughout our body, parts of it are dying. Literally, cells are dying all the time. And so you may have muscles, but 
as you go, as the years go by, the fewer and fewer of the cells are operating, are, are working the way they're supposed to. That's true in our organs too. And so that's hard to do anything about. Um, that comes from x-rays, it comes from, you know, cosmic radiation, it comes from um, poisons in foods, um, toxins that are produced in our bodies, um, all kinds of things, wrong lack of vitamins and minerals and, and uh, other nutrients, um, lack of water, that's a, a big one, that's a big one. And a lot of, I, I found that at this point in my life, I'll start to feel so tired and my mind is not working right. And then it just takes a while and then it hits me, water. I'm dehydrated. And so I drink some water. Um, half an hour later, I'm ready to do anything. What a difference that makes. And um, I see that with a lot of people. They say, oh, I'm so tired today, or I'm so this, or I'm so that. I say, try drinking some water. Maybe you're dehydrated. So that's another one. Uh, so at, we tend not to notice that we need water. Uh, theoretic, all animals know exactly how much water they need, but as because of what I call recreational drinking, drinking, <laughs> drinking beverages, um, yeah. kids drink soda, all these things um, uh, pervert our sense of uh, thirst. So we have to know more than just our thirst, sense of thirst would, would uh, tell us. Uh, One of the things I used to tell my athletes all the time when I, I coached my kids' wrestling team for a while was just the old adage of, if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's right. Yes. Yes. I agree. That is a real, that's a, a real sign now. It's like your oil light went on uh, on your yeah. car, <laughs> <laughs> which is at the very end. They used to have gauges so you could tell what the yeah. oil pressure was. Um, so lack of leg strength is a big one because people sit all the time. And as, um, if you were, for example, um, in bed, let's say in the hospital for a week or two, you can lose a very large fraction of your strength. Uh, muscles deteriorate very quickly. That, that's a, a given. And it's much harder to get that strength back. And so sitting is something that uh, older people do a lot. Um, the, you're not as active, so you tend to sit. And sitting is not good for the body anyway, but certainly the legs start to lose their, their strength. And leg strength is a very important thing in mobility. And I, I, I teach seniors and I work, um, now it's on Zoom, but uh, before that I worked, uh, it was in a, a, a retirement home and I'd see all these people in wheelchairs and how limited they are, or even walkers. And when you're, you have a walker, then that's more deterioration because you're not really using everything. And so what happens is uh, the, when you lose your mobility, you're losing a lot. And other people have to do a lot of things for you and you're, not depend you're dependent and not independent anymore. So leg strength is very important. So I'll, at some point I'll give an exercise for improving leg strength. Um, and flexibility is another one. If whatever you don't use, you, you lose. And um, the uh, al alignment is another one that throws people off. And what I see a lot of elderly people, including, I've had this for most of my life and it was getting worse. Uh, and that is the following. What happens is uh, the upper back starts to um, cur get more and more curved. Mm. And now the, is the sound okay at this point? Oh yeah, it's just fine. Um, now, what happens is that the, the um, physical therapist will say, stand up straight. The only way they, that people know to do that is to tense the muscles in the back. Mm. You can only do that for a minute. Those muscles will become so, especially because they're, they're in an extended length, they're, they've been stretched over a period of time, and they've lost their tone, and they're in, they're, they hurt. 
can't do it. So what happens is they're hunched over like this, the head points down, then they bring up the head to try to compensate and that's not even enough because some of them are like 90 degrees. So then the next thing they do is bring their, their pelvis forward and now they're like this and they now they try to walk that way. And that's really a precursor to falling. When, when, they're, when the alignment is off, it's a big thing. So the solution that I found and my newest book, I have a chapter, it's chapter six, on how I recovered from being hunched over that way. Hmm. And it wasn't from tensing the muscles in the back. That's a, a, a way, uh, not a way to do it. But I did it from ex extending the muscles in the front. Hmm. You're pulling the shoulders yeah. back. See, I'm not doing that. I'm opening the front and supporting, and then those muscles in the back can relax. Okay. And then doing exercises my, with bands, pulling down this way, with my arm, elbows back, pulling mm -hmm. down, and pulling down this way, pulling forward, all these things to, to uh, pull, do all the exercises that can strengthen those muscles in the back. Another one is bringing my shoulders forward, up, back, and I keep them all the way back as I go down. That also, there are 14, I think, muscles that connect to the scapula, and that's exercising them. And then keep them, keep my shoulders back as I come up. See? And that's really getting, and I do that a few times every day. Yeah, that's a Rice that, Krispies exercise for me, man. Snap, crackle, yes. and pop. And you start to feel how out of tone those muscles, some mm, of those yeah. muscles are. And that, and the first time I did it, I was sore for a few days. <laughs> and I invented that. I don't know. Other people may have too. Um, but I, the first time I did this, I said, wow, this is great. And then I was sore for a few days. But, then, <laughs> but now I do it, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, that's a big one, but opening the front and supporting with the front, see, it's something you really have to learn. It's not an easy thing. Yeah. And this is also part of Tai Chi, to, to have what is called Nei Jin, which is expansive strength, so that it's not contr using contraction of muscles, but expanding. And that, I think, was the one of the things that made Tai Chi be such a successful martial art. It's only in Tai Chi that, that I've heard about that. Um, so, uh, Ne means inner, and Jin is a, a kind of strength that is educated, that you don't have it to begin with, but you have to educate that kind of strength mm. through a certain kind of practice. But I have, that's a good part of my book, how to do, how to do that, my new book. Um, it's, and a lot of Tai Chi people don't understand that. And, and the ones that, that manifest it and have it have a hard time explaining it. So my goal was to try to put it into um, understandable terms. I feel I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a challenge for a lot of those things where it's, well, you, it'll, you'll know when you feel it. It's very yeah, difficult right. sometimes. The vocabulary isn't present in a lot of ways. And the, my, my um, uh, theory about that is that Taiji was secret. It was only within families. It, was, it may have been taught to outsiders, but only... Uh, very few, very few, and they were accepted as inner students. And the family members, when they were born, they were, they were already seeing the adults doing all the things. I've seen that with my teachers when they had children, how the children were, were getting things right away because they were seeing the parents do it. And uh, it's very different taking a class a few times a week and having a teacher who may not have even him himself or herself been an inside student so we have to unravel a lot of mysteries of the of this stuff mm. so that i don't know of any other subject where you read a book and you 
uh, there are books, there are YouTube videos on how to do these things, how to fix your washing machine, how to, how to um, do things on, with your computer, how, how to put a new battery in your iPhone. And they show every little detail. Taiji, it's just a complete mystery. <laughs> and a lot of, I'm sure it is that way with other martial arts too, but I don't, I don't the ones I've studied tended to be um, explained in a very clear way, I, I found, but Taiji not. I think it's, you know, there's a spectrum, I think, of martial arts training in general, where the as you go along to one side, there gets to be a little more... Yeah, right, right. ...involved yeah. and a little... And I think, as you said, I think a lot of that does historically go back to whether it was taught in secret between family members and had a lineage and almost a, not religious, but something like that vibe to it. Whereas if it was just, you know, one cop telling another cop how to survive a nasty street scuffle, there wasn't as much of that cabal cult vibe to it. Yeah, it was purposely mystified and kept secret to keep it secret and um it, the what's written it, are just references to things that they they already had been taught mm -hmm. and just to remind them it wasn't there to teach it to you so when i read the what are called the taiji classics it i see them as things where if i read it and i understand it it means i have it if i don't understand it i'm not going to get it from that i have mm -hmm. to do more work or get another teacher or whatever and that's great for martial arts geeks like us, but when we're talking <laughs> right. to our parents who aren't uh, who yeah, aren't that's true. interested in doing that, you had mentioned some exercises that we could recommend to help improve balance and yes. survivability in a fall. Uh, and the first one you mentioned here was uh, recognizing the centers of your feet. Okay. Well, This is an exercise um, that that I found is extremely useful. Can, are you mm -hmm. able to see my feet? Yes, yes indeed. Um, I, what I do is stand with my feet parallel, a comfortable distance apart, and I rock forward, mm -hmm. and now I'm on the balls of my feet, mm -hmm. and then I rock back on the heels. And I do that alternately. And each time I do that, I'm crossing the center, wherever that is. And then I take smaller and smaller excursions until I feel that I'm on the center. It's like tuning, tuning something, mm -hmm. fine tuning it. And right now, there it is. And it feels as though if I follow my shin bone down, that point underneath is, is the center. Now that, the center has no weight on it. There's no pressure on that point. But the distribution of, of pressure is centered on that point. Mm. So it's like a, a waiter holding a tray and he holds up the tray and the center of, of that tray or the center mass of that tray is right over the center of his hand which is along this bone. Mm -hmm. See, as he, if, if he, his hand is further back or forward, it's, the tray is gonna tip over. So the forward and back will tell you where the, the center line is um, in the lateral direction. And then you can go to the outsides of the feet. See, I'm on the outer edges of both mm. feet. And this, people feel, is very difficult to do. It shouldn't be. And then the insides of the feet. This is the way a lot of people are, which is not correct. It's a bad alignment. It's called pronation. And then go take those alternate excursions and now I end up on the the um, what are called sagittal center lines of my feet the forward center lines of my feet and the intersection of those two center lines is the actual center mm. and so when I if I'm standing and I want to lift this, the other foot as that foot goes out, what happens is I start, the, the weight of this is pulling me forward and I'm going to fall mm. if I don't do anything. So what I have to do when the leg goes forward is I have to go back so that mm. I still feel that same feeling on the sole of my foot. See? 
and then I go back, my body has to go, f whoops, I lost my balance. Body has to go forward, just the right amount. And it's not only forward, but sideways too. Mm -hmm. If my leg goes out, I have to move my body oppositely. And you want to feel that. Balance and adjust it, adjust where your body is all the time. So if I, a good exercise is take, take a step forward. As you step forward, doing it so slowly, now I touch the floor and then shift on. I'm shifting sort of diagonally almost. And now take, feel my, the center, adjust, and then step forward. So just moving the leg all around all different directions, all the ways it can move is very good. But doing it slowly so that you're mindful of, the, of where the weight distribution is, trying to keep it centered on the center of the foot. You, people who have serious balance problems can use a, a chair or something, or something to hold on to, but always minimally, with a minimum amount of pressure. Just maybe touch it with a finger if necessary, if you, if you need to, so that then you can do these exercises. Um, I taught about 20 years ago, I taught in a senior center, uh, Taiji there, and every, there were a number of students who had fallen. They were very concerned about it. One of them had fractured her wrist, and she had fallen a number of times. And we did these exercises every class, five minutes. It was great for me too. I got, a, I got a lot out of doing that. I could see my balance improving just in a few minutes from doing that. It's, it's really amazing. And um, then the class ended, it must have been about 10 years ago that the class ended. And I more recently met her uh, at a concert and we talked a little while and I said, hey, have you fallen since, since we did Tai Chi? She said, no, nope, haven't fallen. So hmm. it's, it's not proof, but it, it's, um, it's evidence. <laughs> it's evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and those, just those simple exercises, I feel like a lot of people end up where they, maybe they need to use a cane for a while or they're having some balance issues and there's this sense of, well, okay, I, it was it was a nice run, <laughs> and they. But doing these exercises, even if you have some balance issues now, can, at the very least, prevent them from getting worse, and in many cases, uh, reverse the effects so that a year from now maybe you don't need that cane, or maybe you've moved from a walker to a cane. Yes, and and or it could even maybe it'll even get worse, but at a slower rate than if you mm -hmm. didn't do the exercises. Yeah. That's progress, but I think it. It can improve, you can notice the improvement in, in a few minutes when you do it. Um, th there's no question in my mind about that. Um, so that, that is, I feel, an extremely valuable exercise to do. And that's also in my new book, too. And is that simply finding that center line or the center of the feet, the center of the balance? Of the feet. Yes, mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole chapter on balance. and having to do with vision, having to do with, with a number of, of, of issues. And you touched on something that I remember from a drill I did long ago where when we walk naturally, it's basically a series of controlled falls where we stick our foot out until we lose our balance and fall a quarter of an inch onto our feet. Yes. And, that, and instead walking like you were just demonstrating where instead of that, you put the foot out and place it before you lose your balance it's not only a good exercise for awareness and mindfulness of your walk and out of your alignment, but also if you just end up walking like that, you are less likely to fall if you yes. trip or slip. Can I show you something? Absolutely. Well, yes. Um, I see people walking, usually young people, they have a normal amount of, of movement of the leg and then they reach out, especially short people too. Um, being, one, being one of those, I, I probably did that too. But there's a natural swing and that's enough. So you, you need to, when you walk, just take small steps. The larger the step, the more you're falling on that foot. And also, if it's, if, if it's slippery, you're sliding because the foot is so far out that you're doing that. 
So that's what you want to do is just deliberate small steps. And again, whatever you practice, you get good at. And if you practice the other, you get good at that. So if you practice bad things, you get good at those also. <laughs> You're, you're forming habits every day. It's up to you whether they're good habits or bad habits. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. Now, you had also mentioned here some exercises for improving alignment, which, um, as you mentioned before, is one of the major things, especially as we get older and we get stove up here, or less flexible there. Well, uh, I, what are some, some good ones? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I talked about opening the front. So it's, it's a question of feeling all this area expanding and it's similar to breathing in but breathing has doesn't have to happen for in or out how it doesn't ha have to happen for that but it's the same feeling as breathing we're expanding if you could put your hands or have somebody else put their hands on your waist area and expand that mm. that's something because that the diaphragm is something that we use many many times a day so we're my waist been expanding expanding. <laughs> <Sorry>? <laughs> my waist's been expanding for years sorry my waist has been expanding for years right uh, <laughs> i know what you mean uh, but doing it by it has it's not breathing in or out you can you can do it you can see what breathing that breathing does do that but expanding the diaphragm and feel that feeling and then try to get it into the front of the body to support mm. so that's um one alignment issue the main alignment issue is the um alignment of the of the spine mm. and the other alignment issue is the, the the a lot of people have their knees caving in and that also produces a lot of pain and um deterioration of the joint and uh, it's stretching muscles on this side and, and pinching muscles, uh, tendons and ligaments on this side and pinching on this side. So what this exercise is going, finding the center lines of the feet, like you're on ice skates, will give you, will automatically give you the correct alignment of the knees. Mm. So the, the two go together the alignment and feeling the what the balance points excellent okay so the, those are the main alignments that um that i'm concerned about okay and if we spend even five minutes ten minutes a day on this oh yes we could we could see some improvement yes so when i'm in the supermarket or something i'm walking around i feel myself hunching over i open just open this up. I'm not pulling back. I, you want to feel your back to know that you're, if you're using contraction to do it. It's just, it's a very subtle thing. So you don't, it, there may not even be any movement associated with it. It's just a, a feeling of an opening. So if I'm like this, this is collapsed. And now I'm not, I'm going to try not to use my back muscles to do this. There. See? Oh, interesting. This expansion. Uh, that's going to be important to me. I already feel I'm at risk. As a as a freelance writer, I spend a lot of time like this. Yes. <laughs> at a computer, yeah. The last book I wrote, I spent a, a, over a year, every day, hours mm -hmm. and hours at the computer. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If, if Five years ago, if I had done that, I would have had all kinds of back problems. This... I didn't because of, of this. Mm. So at, the, at first, it's just a little tiny germ of something that you experience, but then it grows as you practice it, and it becomes something that is where it feels like you have so much more strength than you ever could have imagined. And mm. there it is, see, there. I'm relaxing the back, opening the front. See, and I'm not lifting my chin. I'm not pulling my chin up hmm. or trying not to. I'm just letting the, the head balance on the atlas, the skull balance on the atlas. See? And it's this way, it's this way, it's this way, this way, all directions, opening the front to support. It's not tensing anything. Tensing is the opposite. 
That looks good. Yes. Yes. I'm gonna have to play with this. This yeah. is. Yeah, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to play with this. This seems like uh, this is definitely a value. I can already tell because my occupational hazard, as I was just mentioning. And think of what it, I'll have to fiddle with that. Think of what it's doing to the organs, to the yeah. lungs, to the heart, to the digestive organs. To have everything punched up, compressed this way, not getting the oxygen, not getting the movement, not getting the nutrients, not expelling wastes, you know, the, the metabolic wastes of all the organs. This opens everything. And you, what, what happened is, I know somebody who was very hunched over, and she told me that she has this thing where her heart pounds. And she went to uh, the heart doctor and the, the heart doctor said, I did it, and this was the top doctor too, really top guy in the field, I knew, I, I knew that. He said, there's nothing wrong with your heart. Don't worry about it. Hmm. And that was years ago. More recently, I was sitting and I was looking at something like this and my heart started pounding. And I realized I, I opened up like this and it stopped. And I realized that this woman is like this all the time. How, how does her heart d deal with that? It has to do yeah. much more work. So that, now, can I prove that all of this is true? No, but I really think it is. So well, that calls to mind. Uh, everything years open and yeah. breathe. <laughs> but that calls to mind two years ago, my father had a heart attack. And he's dealing with that. And the two activities his cardiologist said he's never allowed to do again are shoveling snow and raking leaves. Because hmm. it, for that same reason, it collapses and everything you just said. And it yeah. exacerbates that, the stance you're in when you do those things. And apparently those are just terrible for your heart if your heart's already wounded. Yeah, but, so. but shoveling snow is is yeah. very vig vigorous and if you're not doing mm. it on a regular basis which you tend yeah. not to <laughs> uh, you don't know when to stop so knowing yeah. when to stop is so important mm. uh so when i shovel snow which i still do you know i have a snow blower even that is it, strenuous for me you know jockeying it around but when i sh but there are places i have to shovel when i do it i sort of stop and monitor myself how mm. fast is my heart beating how, you know, rest, wait. I take, take my pulse, I can feel, you know, feel it very easily when, I, when, I'm, when it's beating fast. And I, I know now how to relate that to almost a number. And um, I rest, go, in, go back in the house, rest, have, some, have something to, uh, uh, some hot drink or something. Then go out and do the rest. But the tendency is, especially if people who are used to doing a lot of things all their lives, they don't take into account that now they can't do it that way anymore. And that brings us back to mindful knowing awareness. When, <laughs> knowing when to stop. Same thing yeah. with eating. <laughs> it's the same thing. Knowing when to stop. <laughs> Dr. Chucker, I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, before we finish, though, you've done a you've been a lecturer for most of your adult life. You've taught Tai Chi internationally. You've been up. You've been interviewed before. You've been up to talk before. Is there something that you don't get enough opportunity to talk about that you'd like to hold forth on for a bit? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I think right now with my new book, I'm getting more opportunities than I can deal with. <laughs> Outstanding. Outstanding. <laughs> no, it was a great interview. You, you were really, um, it was a good interchange. I, I loved it. Oh, you're too kind. Well, thank you very much. And folks, again, you will find the link to the doctor's new book in the show notes. And it's, is it out now or is it coming out it's soon? It's on Amazon, yeah. If you just look Amazon up my right name, um, you, you'll find it right away. Outstanding. And yep, go check that out. If you're interested in Tai Chi at all, it's absolutely worth your while. If you're not even interested in Tai Chi, it's probably worth your while. As we've been talking about, you don't have to go deep into the martial arts to benefit from some of the basic exercises that can improve your lifespan and the quality of your life during that span. Yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. 
Today's episode was brought to you by our heroes over at Patreon. Todd Elner, Beth Edwards, Douglas Sedevy, Hugh O'Donnell, Art Brick, American Institutes of Kempo, Beth Pratt, Richard Hubbard, Wayfinder Advantage, Kit Bradley, Lee Douglas, Amy Rivers, Neil Festine, Kate Carlson, Rom Payton, Jenny Coakley, and Chris Jordan. Join the illustrious heroes by backing us at patreon.com slash safestfamily. If you can't, that's okay, but do consider liking us and subscribing here on YouTube or sharing your favorite episodes on social media. Even a little bit on your end can make a lot of difference here. Thank you for watching today. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.